Good morning. Um, welcome to Sunday Brunch. I'm glad that you guys are here with us this morning as we engage in God's Word together. The way that we do this is that you're going to have a lot of conversation around your tables. Um, we will have a process that we follow. We call it pray. So P-R-A-Y. And as we go through that process, I encourage you to think about how could I do this in my own family, in my own household, so even with my own self. So those of you who are listening online, when you think about the first part of this, of pausing, how important that is to pause for a moment and let the Lord and the Spirit of God speak to you. So as we begin this morning, as we begin the process of praying, we pause to be still, to breathe slowly and to recenter our scattered senses upon the presence of God. So let's take a moment and breathe in and breathe out and breathe in and breathe out. God is here. The presence of God is not just something that's euphoria out there somewhere is he's here so i want you to imagine a little bit about jesus sitting at your table today not to judge you but to simply love you so you guys know i'm a nebraska cornhusker football fan and i haven't talked about them because they lose all the time and it's been disheartening for the last 20 years. So I read an article this morning about the coach. And the game yesterday, they did win. But in the game, they had about four times that they entered the red zone. And each time they fumbled or turned it over. So the score should have been like 50 to 7, but instead it ended up being 20 to 7. And on one of those scores, it was really important that they would score to kind of close out the game. And their running back, he fumbled. And so the head coach went to the defense, and they were already saying, we're ready to play, we're going to play, we're going to play, we're going to play. Um, and he walked in there, and they're like, we got it, coach, we got it. And he goes... Do you guys love your running back? Get out there. And I thought about that just for a moment, how much we sometimes focus on frustrations instead of loving maybe even the source of the frustration. So as we think about pausing, think about Jesus sitting at your table and just simply loving you. So he's not looking at everything you did wrong last week. He's just glad you're here. And so those of you that are online, we are also glad that you're online. And I want you to do the same thing. Look around at your family and know that Jesus is sitting right there with you. Let's pray. O oh Lord, you who have made everything on the earth and given breath to all who are in your house today, we give you thanks. Your fingerprints dwell on us, and you invite us to dwell with you for eternity. We marvel that the Lord of the universe invites us into his presence, power, and authority. We rejoice that the Lord of the universe says to each of us to come and sit with him, listen to him, and live with him. Thank you, Lord, for being our everlasting Father. Amen. So that's the first part of pray, pausing. So in pausing, you think about what the Lord has already shown you. To me, the Lord showed me that small little article this week. So a lot of times when we think about Christian disciplines, we think that they can only come from some kind of pastor or some kind of religious article but God is everywhere, and he is showing up everywhere. So look for him, and when you look for him, you'll start seeing those things that he's asking you to do. 
So the second part is to rejoice and reflect. So P is to... And the second part is to rejoice and reflect. And so we are reflecting on the creative power of God, how he is in all creation and how he's done everything with creation. And we look back at Psalm 8 of the ancient words that he spoke to his people. O Lord, our God, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with the glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean's currents. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. So our reflection passage this morning comes from Paul. And as we look at Acts, it's going around the story of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. So Paul, he was always discipling. So that's something that you can, if you think about Paul, Paul rarely did things just by himself. He always brought someone with him. And on this trip, he chose to bring Silas. And Timothy's kind of in the background on this story as well. But as we engage in Acts chapter 17, so if you want to look on your phones and look that up, you can. That's the story that we're going to be looking at. You'll see Paul, Timothy, and Silas engaging in spreading God's news. So as they talk about the story of Jesus with new people, they often would go to the local synagogue. And so Paul would go there because that's where people of faith were gathering. He would begin teaching them, this is how the Messiah is revealed. And then he would see, you know, many times he'd have a lot of people upset with him, and then they'd start shoving him out of the city. They'd stone him, whip him, whatever it'd take, get him out of their system, right? Because they didn't want that. Other times, there was a few of them that would respond to the message and then immediately begin following. And what did their following look like? It looked like if all the rest of you took me out and stoned me, this table would invite me over to their home. To great danger and peril of themselves. Because they've just told the rest of the community, I don't care what you do to us. We want this message. I think that's pretty dramatic as you think about the beginning of the church and what the church was trying and how the church started under the, the grace of God. So one of the things that occurred in this chapter is as Paul was preaching to a community of believers, the synagogue, there began this common thing that we know of, jealousy. And it says a very clear in there, in the scripture, that jealousy began to erupt among the Jews who didn't receive the message. And I found that interesting in this chapter. That, again, here's my people. <laughs> you all didn't receive the message. You're jealous of them. Why? I mean, perhaps the message of Jesus, as Paul preached it, was just too simple. It didn't involve all the rules and regulations. And I'm preaching to th this group and saying, love Jesus. And love your neighbor. And you're thinking about, boy, we can't touch anything on Sundays. We can't do anything. We can't eat certain foods. We can't do this. Because we're trying to appease an angry God. And hope that he won't have his 
vengeance upon us. Maybe it was that. Or maybe it was the, the inclusion of Greeks or people who were not Jews, Gentiles. This group wouldn't have just been Jews, it would have also been some Gentiles. Were you upset about that? That it was a mixing of those groups. Now remember that for Jews to invite a Greek into your home or someone who was not Jewish, it made your house unclean. Made you unclean. Or maybe it was because they all had this joy that they really wanted and they didn't understand why they had it. I don't know, but that was one word that struck me is the jealousy that erupted among the Jews who didn't receive the message. And we don't know exactly why, but I do think that jealousy prompts people to do things that they wouldn't normally normally do or ordinarily do but there was a guy named jason among them so we'll make tyler jason jason who believed this message he then invited paul over to his house like i had said in the beginning and the leader of the church he would have been kind of the leader in a sense he was hosting this part they're going, the rest of you are going after Paul. You can't stand him. You want to get rid of him. But Jason has already sent Paul on his way. And so then they go after Jason. Because when you can't get the person that you're mad at, then you just go after whoever is in the way. And I found that to be interesting. That here, historically, this is what's going on in the church, but isn't that what we do today too? When jealousy erupts, think about who you start becoming angry at when you can't get to the person that you're really mad at. So the leader of the church, of the Jerusalem church of the day, was James. We talked about him a little bit in the last few weeks. Now, this is not Peter, James, and John. Remember, James has already been killed at this point. This is James, we believe, the brother of Jesus. So a younger brother of Jesus from Mary and Joseph at that time. He is brought as kind of the leader of the Jerusalem church. And he wrote a letter called James. This is what he says. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong, and you want only what will give you pleasure. So Paul, Timothy, and Silas were not found by the Jews. They actually went on to another part of the country. And as Paul's preaching the message, he moves on to this area called Thessalonica. And as he's in there, he moves on to another place because they get upset with him. And it's the area called, that you probably well know, is Athens. So Greek or Greece. So Athens has been around for a long time. And as he goes into Athens, of course they have a lot of these different gods. And he's walking through, seeing these saints, as he calls for Silas and Timothy to come and join him. And that leads us to the part that we're going to read today. So I want you to listen real carefully as we read through this story. And then don't look at the verses again, because one of you will retell the story at your table. So this time you're not going to have to do it publicly, but be ready to volunteer at your table to retell what you heard. Here we go. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. 
he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. And he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic, Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he picked up? Others said, he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. Then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For, all, for as I was walking along, I saw many of your shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples and human hands cannot serve his needs for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His, pur his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice, but then he has appointed, and he approved, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt. But others said, we want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them, but some joined in and became believers. Among them were Dionysus, Dios, Diosinus, a member of the council, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. So, who would like to retell this story at your table? And you can go ahead and start now. Remember, as we retell the stories, actually, I'm going to just pause you from retelling the story. It is a long reading. So I'm not expecting you to get every detail. Retell the story of what you remember and start now. No, go ahead. So don't look at the scripture. If you have finished telling the story at your table, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, great. Okay, so everyone that didn't retell the story, this is new, so get ready for this. <laughs> You're now on board Someone from your table, other than the person that retold the story, retell one thing that you remember from what they said. Something that stuck out. So back here. So he included everyone. He included the Gentiles and the Jews. He wanted them to listen to the message of Jesus. Awesome. This table. Did you get there? <laughs> One thing you remember. He's not an unknown God. He's not an unknown God. He's been there forever. This is God and it's eternal forever. Awesome. This table. So 
So he is different from all the other gods. This table. So he wasn't an idol that you could start that you could carve from stone, wood, or melt gold into. This table. So here in Athens, this very secular city, and they have all these gods to choose from. Some of them believed and followed. This table back here. They followed to the city in the synagogue. Rather than Yes. So a switch in what he normally would do, he went to, and I wonder, was the synagogue not around? Did they have a synagogue in Athens? But he chose the city center. This table. Is this one big table? His name is Paul, or otherwise known as Minnie Mouse. All right. So at your tables, here's your first question I want you to talk about. Thank you, everyone, for thinking about this. Um, as a pastor and as a follower of Jesus, one of the things that I think is really important to hear God's word, to help us retain it, is to talk about it. So when we just read it, Sometimes we don't really get into the meaning of it unless we actually listen to other people talk about it. So that's one of the reasons why we do it this way. All right, so at your tables. Who is someone you know who's religious regardless of what kind of religion? So they don't have to be Christian. They can be anything. But they are very religious. And I want you to think about that term. So go ahead and talk at your tables. And this is not gossiping. This is actually just stating facts. This person is very religious. Okay, I know that not everyone got to share. Because when you talk about someone that you know is religious, you often want to give kind of background, which is great. So if you didn't get to share at your table of someone that you think is very religious, that's okay. Just retain it in your head. Because these are two questions I didn't add in here, but I'm going to now. So who says that being religious is really positive? Did you hear some positive attributes of that? Okay, so start throwing them out. Structure, commitment, what else? What's that? Morality. Discipline. Any more? Passion. Accountability. Okay, now, of the people that you're thinking who are very religious, do you see some negative aspects? Okay, close-mindedness. Angry. Judgmental. So relying on things that we would say are apart from God. Uncompromising. I didn't hear you, Marika. I'd still entitled. This ear must not be working. <laughs> Entitled. So as you think about Paul walking in this, there was a comment, and I'm going to just pull that in. He saw a lot of religious people, but he spoke to all of them. He didn't look for the most religious or the most unreligious. He didn't look for the person that was saying, I really love Jesus, 
or I, I want something different. He just spoke to all of them. Now, if God is revealed through his creation, why do you think Paul still told the people of Athens about Jesus? So, just to give you a little more background on this question, if God says that he can be seen through anything, why does Paul need to tell them about Jesus? Go ahead and talk at your tables. Okay. Does anyone want to share one thought that they heard that struck them? As people were talking about, why would Paul still tell the people of Athens about Jesus if God is already revealed through creation? Anyone bold enough to just share what they heard that struck them? Thanks, David. Awesome. So when we talk about him speaking specifically to the Athenian about Jesus, I put this question in here because I think sometimes for us, we do the same kind of thing of that maybe we're free about, maybe we're more like Hindus. Ooh. We're free about just talking about kind of a God. That feels comfortable. But putting Jesus maybe makes it a little more uncomfortable. And I do think looking at this story through the whole chapter of 17, you have to think about Paul. And I think one of the things we heard from being religious is passion. The passion that he had behind this, mes this message. He had already been kicked out of two other cities before he arrived in Athens. And those two cities had synagogues. They had a Jewish population. Athens did not seem to be as Jew prevalent. This would have been possibly where he would have thought, this is where I could be killed. But instead, he says the exact message of Jesus to people who have never heard it before waiting to see what their response would be. So the next question is, why do you think people of faith are often more afraid of earthly consequences than eternal ones? And you can just shout it out. We're not going to do a table discussion because we've got to move on. <laughs> yes, yeah, so... Do you think Paul knew how stoning hurt? I mean, just, that's real, right? So maybe you've shared your faith with someone before and you were rejected. That's real. It's a real feeling. Do you kind of shy away from sharing again? But beyond that, they hurt. So why do we pull onto those more than eternal ones? They're immediate. So 
that actually comes back to a sermon that our good Pastor Rob had about our lives, the moment you believe, your eternal life has already started. It's very immediate, but somehow the tangible hurts are more immediate to us. When you break your leg, it's immediate. And there's a consequence with that that's enduring. All right. We do this each time. Take time to write down five names to mine. Each time I do this, I never see anyone write any names down. So I'm going to change this at some point. Mentally write down five names in in your head that you will begin praying that God will give you an opportunity to bless these individuals this week. Now, at your tables, this is one thing we're going to do. I'm not going to go through this. You're going to tell each other what bless is. So go ahead, start now. You only have a a minute to do this. If you don't know what bless is, which I'm going to join your table, start now. So, okay, hopefully you've done the B-L-E-S-S. I'm sure you're talking about other things at this point. Listen to the story again. And see if the Spirit of God speaks something directly to your heart. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason... Oh, there's my answer. Yeah. So I miss that. Look what struck me. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to tell all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he picked up? Others said, it seems to be, he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. Then they took him to the high council of the city. Come tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that all Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows, Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it, To an unknown God. This God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in a man-made temple. And human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything and satisfies every need. From one man he created all the nations through the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far away from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt, but others said, we want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them, but some joined him and became believers. 
Among them were Dionysus, a member of the council, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. So at your tables, what does this tell you about God? So hopefully you've heard a little bit what this tells us about God. Now in large group, so all together, what does this tell us about people? Let's just kind of shout this out real quick. Like, or real slow. What does this tell us about people? We look for easy answers. We're thick. Is that what you said? We're thick. What else? So some of us will believe and some will not. Some will say, this struck me as well, beyond the synagogue. This, let's hear more about this later. And that can be both positive and it can also be, it never happens. We tend, or we do, <laughs> overcomplicate our relationship with God. If Paul walked through Houston today, he'd walk through a lot of Christian churches and say, you've got a lot going on here, but I don't see Jesus. If he walked into your house, he may say something similar. You got a lot going on, but where's Jesus? What else does it tell us about people? Anything else? Yeah, so we seek tangible things, which that makes a connection to something that was said about why we fear earthly consequences more than eternal ones. We really like tangible things, right? Um, we seek control. We want to be able to put the idol away when we don't want to obey. I just came up, I just came up with that. That's pretty good, huh? All right, I want you to think about this eternally, eternally, and internally. <laughs> Did you, were you hoping I'd catch that? <laughs> so as you think about this internally, for eternity, I want you to think what words of encouragement so was there something in the story or something around the tables or something in the large group that was said that really encouraged you? Or is there something that you heard that convicted you? And let that settle on your heart as you go into this next week. Because I believe the Lord is speaking as we said in the beginning, he's here. He's, Jesus is sitting at your table. He's heard the discussion. He listens really well. And he wants to speak to you. So if there's something that hits you, that encouraged you or convicted you, listen to him. So if you believe those words are true, what change will you make this week in your life? So it could be things like that, Rosalina. Thanks for sharing. You don't have to share right now. I mean, I love that you did. So maybe the Lord is convicting or encouraging you, it can be both, and to speak to someone who 
has kind of rejected Jesus in the past, as far as you know. I mean, we don't know, really. I don't know. Only he knows who has accepted or rejected. All right, we're on to the next part. So the reflection and the rejoicing is always longer than everything else. Here we're at asking. So we're going to be asking God to help us make the changes that we heard as we walk through this today. We're going to pray for those who are religious but don't know Jesus. So I want you to think about those individuals. You can be religious and know Jesus. You can. But there are many who are religious and don't know him. And that is in the Christian church and in Hindus and every other religion out there. So Christians are not apart from this. Let us ask the Lord also to curb our jealous intentions and instead help us to live with thankful hearts, trusting in his provision alone. So those are three things that we're going to be asking the Lord about. At your tables, take a moment. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to pray for things that are on your heart. Those are three things that you can pray for. So you can choose as a table to do this silently or all together. So you get a choice. And then I'm going to close this with the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have heard our words. You know what is on our hearts. You know us intimately, and you love us infinitely. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who can sit down with us, who's made us in your image, and has called us to be your children. And as your children, we pray the prayer that your Son taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we're at the last part here yielding. So Lord, we ask you to help us to yield to who you are and who you made us to be. Help us to be brave, sharing your story wherever we find ourselves. We are not Paul, yet we can learn from his actions of tenacity with sharing your story, regardless of the consequences. So often we look at earthly consequences like they are more severe than the consequence of living without you. Help us to see the blessing in serving you no matter what. Help us to trust you, to trust your protection, your provision, and your power over all else. And join me in our closing prayer. Father, help me to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Holy Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and say. Amen.